Hi, my name is Mike Gaiman and welcome to episode 14 of my beta campaign. We have just a single mission in this particular video, but it is a big one. And carrying out that mission, we have the Ptolemy. And the Ptolemy is on its way to Duna. Now you might recall a couple of episodes ago, I was bemoaning the fact that I had missed my Duna window. Well, after making that episode, I went back and took a look and found out, and I won't get into how I was misreading things before, but I found out that I was wrong. Well, quite obviously, because here it is. And I was had enough time to put this craft together, put it into the building queue, push it up to the front of the building queue, and launch it. So here it is on its way into low carbon orbit, uh, and ready for its, and then going to get ready for its transfer burn out to Duna. Now, as you can see, this is an unmanned craft. With the mods I have installed, I am not capable at this point of sending a manned mission to Duna. As well, this is an orbiter. And the mission plan is for it to get a capture around Duna, uh, do a little bit of exploring around Duna. Uh, also, I hope to get over to Ike and uh, hopefully get a capture of Ike as well and collect some science, both high altitude and low altitude, over both of those two bodies. So let's talk a little bit about the vessel. I've packed it up with whatever science I could muster, including that new magnetometer. That's the long rod that you see kind of sticking out there towards the camera at the back. Uh, and that's coming from the uh, interstellar mod. Um, the two pieces of science I don't have on it, as I do not have either the mystery goo containers or the materials bay because I find that the transmission return on those are pretty poor and I don't really frankly think they're worth the fuel to lug them all the way out there to do now. I'm actually collecting a little bit of science there from the uh, new magnetometer uh, because I've never had this thing up into orbit just yet. Um, it's also in two stages. There is the main probe body which is most of what you see there uh, from those a little bit, the, the engines out at the back of those um, toroidal fuel tanks, those orange fuel tanks from that forward is the main probe. And then behind that is a transfer vehicle, which is what's going to give us our escape velocity and our transfer velocity to get us to Duna, and then it's going to detach. Okay, so let's take the time to talk about interplanetary transfers. And surprisingly, they're not really all that different from regular orbital transfers that we've already talked about. There's Duna there, we've just selected it as the target, and there's Kerbin in its lower orbit. And because it's in the lower orbit, it's going faster, so that's why we're launching with Duna ahead of us, so that we will catch up to it. Um, because we, we want to launch in a prograde direction, because we're raising the orbit, we're going to put the maneuver node on the trailing edge of Kerbin. Remember, Kerbin is moving uh, in a direction to the right now. So we put the maneuver node at the trailing edge of Kerbin so that when we burn, we will be burning uh, towards the right um, in a prograde direction. So we start pushing it up until we get our escape velocity and there's our orbit there. And you can see again, I'm using precise node to help us do this. Um, you can play around a little bit with the timing back and forth. I'm starting to get my uh, indicators, my close approach indicators. And I'm playing around with uh, where, look, I'm looking at that periapsis as well. And because you want to have the periapsis of, your, of the orbit that results from your escape burn to be pretty close to where Kerbin is. That tells you you kind of are doing it right. And there I have my encounter now. There it is. There's the encounter. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to switch over and look at the view from Duna. So I switch in view to Duna. Take a look on in there so I can see how I'm doing and oh wow that is pretty close you can see I'm coming below it so I am going to have to burn normal at some point but uh, you don't want to do that normal burn now right now you want to make this burn purely just prograde we'll do the normal burn correction when we're out in deep space it'll be much more efficient there um, but frankly that's pretty good so we're gonna come back and we're taking a look here we're only 15 minutes to our burn, so it's it's time to get this thing going and warp on over there. Now that's 
that's a tight launch window. Usually you end up putting these things up, uh, keeping them in orbit for a few days, waiting for the uh, transfer window. But no, I'm I'm right I'm right there, right ready to go. So uh, yeah, there's nothing left to do but to to burn this thing now. If we take a look at the delta V of the burn, we'll see that we actually have all we need just in that lower stage. So uh, I'm going to use the uh, the flight computer, I think, to uh, execute this burn for me. And while this burn executes, why don't we talk a little bit about who Ptolemy was, or Claudius Ptolemaeus as he was also known because he was born a citizen of the Roman Empire. Uh, he, he did his work in the second century AD. However, he was of Greek descent and he was born in Alexandria in Egypt. So I suppose there are lots of nations that can claim some ownership over this particular individual. Um, he did a lot of different things, but the thing that kind of references, I think, towards the whole space thing is his writing of the Almagest. Uh, that particular document became, or book or volume became, basically the go-to book, the, uh, the main reference for astronomy right up through the Middle Ages and right up until the Scientific Revolution. Uh, this particular uh, the, uh, model of the solar system and of the universe was, of course, a geocentric one. And it was Ptolemy that really introduced and perfected this idea of the epicycle. Like, he had spheres ro uh, revolving inside spheres. So it wasn't just things moving around in a circle. There were circles in that circle, and then circles in that circle in that circle. And all of this stuff was there to explain the motion of the planets, because um, well, motions of the planets are a little bit weird. They, they can do weird things like go backwards in the sky and stuff like that. And his uh, epicycles actually work really, really well. And in fact, one of the first thing, problems with Copernicus's simple heliocentric model that came obviously much, much later was that it simply didn't work so well. And the reason why Copernicus's model didn't work as well was because he didn't have the epicycles because, well, he, he thought they were kind of stupid, but he was still stuck on circles. And of course, it took a little while later before folks began to realize that uh, circles were something we needed to get rid of. But that is for another time. And with that, our transfer burn is complete. So now it's time to get rid of this lower stage. But, you know, with me, the thought of this lower stage floating around in solar orbit uh, forever and ever, or at least for the rest of this campaign, really bugs me. So I am going to get rid of it. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to burn with it a little bit retrograde. Whoa, that was weird. Okay, I, I got the... the uh, that transfer stage in focus, but somehow I'm still controlling. Okay, that's not cool. So I, I'm going to stop using the flight computer. <laughs> that's a little bit strange. I think I'll have to just do this manually. So I'll turn it around manually uh, retrograde. This thing, as you can probably guess, has a probe body on it, has some batteries on it, so it's going to have power for a little bit, a little while. It still has a tiny bit of fuel left in it, so I'm going to burn retrograde. And the idea here is I want to crash it back into. Kerbin. Now, in real life, they wouldn't do this. Like, for real interplanetary probes and stuff, they just let the debris float around. Apollo debris is still floating around uh, the solar system as well as lots of other things. But uh, what I need to do here is I'm going to burn retrograde and uh, try and get this uh, trajectory back into a Kerbin orbit. And there we go. And then the other thing I need to do now that that has been accomplished is I need to lower my periapsis so that this thing, when it comes around, will crash back into Kerbin. And we do this with, well, you guessed it, with radial burns. We're going to burn radially. And in this case, we're going to burn radially outwards because radially outwards will push that apoapsis away and will bring the periapsis towards, our, sorry, it'll pull the apoapsis towards us and push the periapsis away. Now, unfortunately, I just ran out of fuel. So you might think, oh, well, that's it. He's done. No, I didn't. I, I packed a little bit of extra RCS in here. So I turn on the RCS and throttle. Oh, wait, that doesn't work. I got to activate the engines. And Oh, yeah. 
Okay, that was entertaining. So uh, l let's get myself back under some control here. So, okay, I, I just activated that secondary engine while still having uh, the thrust at full. So you'll have to excuse me while I, I bring this. It's a good thing there isn't anybody on this thing. I think that would be a pretty pretty wild ride. So anyway, getting back to it, I have some RCS tucked inside that fairing. Uh, maybe as it comes around, you can just see those tanks in there. Yep. And so these engines on the side are these RCS engines, but they're not maneuvering thrusters, they're RCS thrusters. So I can activate them and operate them just like regular rockets. And there's more than enough fuel with this RCS that's left to bring this thing down. So again, I'm going to do a combination of burning radially out and a retrograde to one, bring down that apoapsis and lower this orbit, and number two, um, pull or push that periapsis away from me, which will also lower it. And you can see now I'm down into the atmosphere, and with just a little bit more thrusting, I can intersect Kerbin and, uh, and get this thing to come back and leave myself still debris free. And back at the main probe, we can do ourselves a little bit more science with the magnetometer now that we are in high orbit. And then it comes time to raise this antenna. Now, this is an antenna you haven't seen before. Um, this is the Communitron, I think it's 8888 or something like that. It's a dish antenna. It is a directional antenna. You have to point it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to point it at Kerbin because as of this moment, I don't have any satellites once this thing is out past Minmus or so. I do not have any satellites that are capable of communicating with these things because the communication satellites I have out there don't have the antennas with this kind of range. But this particular antenna has enough range to reach all the way out to pass Duna's orbit. So everything inside Duna's orbit, so Duna and Eve and Moho, uh, are well within the reach of this particular antenna. And then it comes time to plot our correction burn. So we're going to go and take a look way out at Duna again. And the first thing I noticed is that I lost my encounter. Uh, I guess maybe the separation or something gave this thing a little bit of a kick, but but no worries. It's, it's just a, a little bit of a tiny little bit of burning just to get that encounter back. And now we can get back to putting in our correction burn. Now the correction burn is going to be uh, normal and radial. So you don't want to be doing that now when you're close to Kerbin and moving very, very fast. You want to do this way out in deep space. So I do a I do a, a, a put, put a maneuver node in pretty much at random. I can see I got to burn normally up. So I put in a few meters per second up, and then I select the periapsis, and then I come back out to the maneuver node, and I grab it, and I start dragging it. And what I'm doing is I'm watching those periapsis numbers, and I want to get that periapsis as close to Duna as I can just by moving the maneuver node back and forth. And when I get that periapsis as small as I can, that will be the best place for me to perform this transfer burn. So then I zoom back in now that I've got the spot that I want. I realize I still got to burn up normally. I want to get up to Duna, obviously, get into the same plane as the plane of Ike. And uh, so I, I, I adjust the norm a little bit till I get into the right plane. And once I got that part right, then I want to start sweeping back and forth radially. And what I'm looking for is to see if I can get an Ike encounter. I would like to see if I can get a Duna encounter and an Ike encounter. Ike can kind of help you as well slow you down. So I sweep back and forth and then I see there's, there's my Ike encounter right there. Now, at the time, I kind of thought I was hitting Ike before I was hitting Duna, but now that I'm looking at it, I can see that my sphere of influence change into Ike at the end of the purple line that's going by Duna is well after going by Duna. So I can tell I'm going to be encountering Ike after Duna, but that's okay. Um, to get my capture, I'm going to be doing a lot of different things. I'll play it by ear once I get out there. You know, I could be doing some retrograde burning, obviously, but I want to minimize that. I might be doing a little bit of arrow breaking. I might be doing um, a little bit of uh, gravity assisting from Ike. I'll take what I can. So right now, I'll kind of just play around with this um, until I sort of have it 
I don't know, re reasonably okay. I'm coming in on the right plane, and I'm going to get my Ike encounter and my Duna encounter in sort of one go. But, you know, this is very, very coarse doing it out here because I'm still not that far from Kerbin. So what I'm just going to do is once I kind of get it reasonably okay, I'm going to use alarm clock, set an alarm um, for when... Uh, this maneuver node is going to occur. I'll give myself about 30 minutes uh, lead time into the maneuver. That'll give me some additional time to do some tweaking, some final tweaking before I do this burn. And I will undoubtedly be doing tweaking as I get close to Duna as well. Uh, and as you can see, if you take a look at the alarm clock, I've al also put in uh, the uh, an alarm for the sphere of influence change when I leave Kerbin's sphere of influence. The reason why I do that is because I find sometimes KSP messes up the trajectories at these sphere of influence changes and I always like to be with the vessel when I change sphere of influence. So that's it, I got my alarm in. I'll be coming to this maneuver in 108 days. So uh, yeah, this, this guy's got some traveling to do before then. And here we are a few days later, and Ptolemy is getting ready to become the first object to leave the Kerbin sphere of influence, well, at least of this campaign. And if you look up there at the top left, you will see that red icon indicating I have no communication link, which is kind of what I expected. Remember, I'm only pointing at Kerbin, and the only thing I could potentially connect with is mission control. Now, the cone from... Uh, from this particular antenna is very, very narrow, as you will see right here. It's so narrow that it's only including a tiny strip of Kerbin. So that's why I figured, oh, well, the Kerbal Space Center is just not in that strip. And then I looked and I saw, well, wait a second, yeah, it is. I can see that the Kerbal Space Center is in the cone. So I was a little bit puzzled as to why I don't have a communications link. I should have had a communications link there. So I went and did a little bit of looking up, and it turns out that in remote tech, the Kerbal Space Center only has a range, the antennas there only have a range of 75,000 kilometers, and as, uh, well, you can't see it right here, but I am well past that right now. So, I don't know, that doesn't make any sense to me that the ground-based antennas have less of a range than the ones that in space do, but... Oh, okay, that's it. So this thing, I cannot communicate with it until I build me some satellites that have some uh, larger antennas on it so that I can reach out to this thing and wake it back up again. But that will have to be for a future episode because this one is coming to an end. Uh, so we hope to see you then.